Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. There's a war on, but it's not being fought with guns. It's the battle for your mind, as forces conspire to slow you down in life's race through confusion and false teaching. They're in control of much of the media, and the enemy of our souls wants nothing less than to control what you think about. Stay with us. From the Moody Church in Chicago, this is Running to Win with Dr. Erwin Lutzer, whose clear teaching helps us make it across the finish line. Pastor Lutzer, the world's onslaught never stops. Is there a defense we can mount to protect ourselves and our loved ones? Dave, as a specific answer to your question, it's very difficult to protect ourselves, but it is possible. I've often thought of the verse of Scripture, and we should think of it more often, when it says, Keep your hearts with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. The mind is the place where we make up our minds, the kind of life that we're going to live the kinds of decisions we're going to make. And you're absolutely right. We are bombarded today, especially because of social media. I would say this, we must discipline ourselves and we must help our children to discipline themselves so that they don't fall into all the traps of the enemy. You know, the Bible in the 12th chapter of the book of Romans, where the apostle Paul says these words, we should renew our mind by the renewing of the mind, of course, through the Word of God. I've written a book entitled, Putting Your Past Behind You. I wrote this book with the intention of helping people because so often we are bogged down with our past. We don't know whether or not God still has a future for us because life can appear to be so dark and our thoughts oftentimes become so negative. There's hope, my friend. This book is one that I think is going to help you run the race of life, and you already know someone who needs it. Here's what you do for a gift of any amount. You go to rtwoffer.com. That's rtwoffer.com. Or you can call us at 1-888-218-9337. That's 1-888-218-9337. 9337. Let us listen carefully to God's Word and let us ask ourselves this question How can my mind be renewed in a day of deception? Our Father, we know that there is a mighty battle going on for our minds. And therefore, we pray that in these moments you might close our minds off from all interference that we might listen to your word with clarity and power and focus. And because we deliver this message in the name of Jesus, we pray that lives will be changed forever. Set your people free. Help all of us to put our pasts, whatever they may be, behind us. For the glory of Christ. Amen. Many years ago, my wife and I had the privilege of being in East Germany to see the sights of the Reformation. We saw that great, big, huge castle called the Wartburg Castle, where Martin Luther stayed for ten months translating the Bible into German. He was hiding there. But as I thought of that castle, it represented a tremendous fortress. Just visualize acres of different kinds of buildings, all surrounded by a huge stone wall with various places for soldiers, for sentries as lookouts. And then around the circle, there was the castle, there was a moat, so that it was not possible for the enemies to come in, though there were some drawbridges to allow the people in the castle to go out. What I'd like to do in the next few moments is ask you to visualize your mind as a castle, as a fortress, if you please. Now, the Bible would teach that there is an enemy without, and that enemy is Satan. He is an evil being who wants to inject thoughts into our minds. That is the enemy without. 
But there is also an enemy within. It is called in the New Testament the flesh. Jesus said that it is from within the heart of man that comes adulteries, fornication, thefts, covetousness. All these things, said Jesus, come from within and defile the man. Those are the enemies that are already within the walls of the castle. One of the questions that is often asked is, how can you tell the difference whether the enemy you are fighting is one who is without or an enemy within? The answer is sometimes you don't know. Because the intention of both sets of enemies are always the same. They converge and their tactics are so much the same that sometimes you can't tell the difference. In extreme cases, you can, but often you can't. I want you to take your Bibles and turn today to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, and we're going to read verses 3 to 5, where the Apostle Paul is talking about a battle, a warfare. It is the battle for your mind. 2 Corinthians 10, 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God, and we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Now, if we're going to be successful in this strategy and the battle and the war for our minds, what we must understand is our own strategy. How do we go about fighting the battle for purity, the victory of the mind? First of all, we must identify the enemy. We've got to identify the enemy. Paul says we are destroying speculations. The King James, I think, says imaginations. You know, God gave us an imagination because the imagination is part of our creativity, our ability to visualize things that are not yet. And yet we read in the Bible repeatedly that the imaginations of men's hearts were evil continuously. And the imaginations, those enemies within, they become our problem in our battle for the mind. I'd like to list some of them for you. First of all, perhaps bitterness, thoughts of bitterness. Someone has done you a bad turn and they have ruined you and they have used you and they haven't even had the good sense to say, I'm sorry. And so in your mind you replay those incidents over and over again and it doesn't alleviate your bitterness or your hatred, but generally replaying them in your mind only intensifies the hatred, the bitterness, the resentment. And there it is in your mind and heart. What about sexual lust? I suppose that there are no imaginations that are so easily justified to the human mind, particularly among those of us who are men, struggling with purity in a world that seems to have simply gone mad in terms of impurity. The hotel room I stayed in on Friday evening in Washington for a few extra dollars, I could have watched a pornographic movie there on the television set. You know, when I think of the availability of this kind of pornography, I just think, what kind of a world are our children and our grandchildren going to live in? And that's why you ought to pray for me and for members of the pastoral staff and for all of our elders and all the church leadership that God might keep us pure and that we might never, never, never touch the dial of that kind of thing that is available in motel rooms today. And some of you who are business people who do a lot of flying and you do a lot of traveling, you ought to have people to whom you are accountable praying for you that the satanic snare that is available virtually everywhere will not get you. And so we have sexual lust. We have addictions. I'm not going to say too much about that. The entire message next week is devoted to addiction. What about guilt and shame? Last week I mentioned to you that... uh, a guilt it does not need to be added to the work of Jesus Christ, and that's very important. What I neglected to say is that guilt does have a very special and important function, namely to drive us to Christ, that we might recognize our helplessness, that we might be aware of our sinfulness, and that we might be driven to Him to be cleansed and to be forgiven. 
What about depression? What about pride? God says he hates a proud look. Now let me tell you that when the imaginations within are in cahoots with the enemy without, and remember the enemies of the soul always are in cahoots with the enemy that is outside of us, when those two converge and work together, you have what is known as a stronghold. You have a part of yourself which is at war with the other part of yourself. And we can call it by a different name. It becomes an obsession. Some people become obsessed with the things that we have listed or perhaps something else that we neglected to list. And these thoughts and these desires simply overrun them and the people are no longer in control because now they are subject to feelings and desires and thoughts over which they have no control whatever. They are being overrun by impurity. So what you have to do is to identify the enemy. Do you recognize the enemy? A second point in the strategy is that you must understand the enemy. Understand the enemy. Paul says that we are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. What is it that raises itself up against the knowledge of God? It is, of course, those thoughts, those aspirations, those imaginations. But now, what are the tactics of the enemy? The bottom line is lies, of course. Lies, 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 lies. Always lies. But what kind of lies? First of all, our enemies pose as our friends. They pose as our friends. In fact, in the very list I gave you, I can imagine someone here saying, Now, wait a minute. Why should I be willing to get rid of my bitternesses? Because after all, you may say to yourself, I am the one who has been wronged, and you're asking me to give up bitterness. So you think bitterness is your friend. You don't recognize it as your personal enemy. Perhaps there's someone here who says, yes, I struggle with lust, but after all of the rejection and all of the hurt that I have received in life, I should at least be allowed to have this small pleasure. And now you want to take this pleasure from me? And you don't even recognize it as your enemy. The addictions, what can we say about those? Somebody says, they are the crutch upon which I build my life. There is no way that I want to give these addictions up. And so you hug your enemies to your bosom and call them your friends. That's a satanic strategy. I want to tell you something, that the reason that these enemies exist and their purpose is, first of all, to totally control you, and secondly, to destroy you. That's why they exist. The scripture says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11, Dearly beloved, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. And the only purpose of a war is that you might eventually control and then destroy the person against whom you are warring. And that's what these enemies are up to. They want our destruction. Your flesh and Satan together want to neutralize your witness for Jesus Christ. They want to fill your mind and your heart with so much defeat and so much impurity. They want that neutralized so that you will live a life that does not please God and a life that will not count for eternity. That's what they're after. They are not your friends. They are your mortal death-to-death -death enemies. But they pose as friends. There's a second lie, and that is... They want us to overrate their strength. They love that. You know what Satan and the flesh would like? They'd like nothing better if you as a Christian simply said, well, you know, I've tried to overcome these things, but I've given up. There's no way that I can do it. I might just as well go with the flow. Ah, the enemy loves it because that's what it wants. It wants to appear formidable. It wants you and me to think that there is no way that we can overcome their strength. There's a third lie. Listen carefully. Satan and the flesh want us to rationalize so that we will actually think that it is possible to be one kind of person on the inside and be a different kind of person on the outside. So people say to themselves, it doesn't matter whether I watch those soap operas because I'm not involved in adultery, though I'm always watching other people who are. 
You see the rationalization? Or the person who's into pornography or whatever else. You see, the rationale is, I can be impure on the inside. I can be rotting on the inside just as long as all of my actions are okay on the outside. It's a lie of Satan. It's the strategy of the devil to subdue, to control, and to destroy. Now let me ask you something. What if all of our thoughts were taken out of our minds and hung on a clothesline to dry? You know, incidentally, we have about 10,000 thoughts a day, I'm told. How would you like to have all of your thoughts last week all strung out for public investigation? One by one, people can walk by and see what you were thinking about. Oh, we would all be so ashamed, so ashamed, wouldn't we? If you saw my list, you'd be so disappointed in me, you'd say, Pastor Lutzer, I'm not even going to listen to you anymore. Now, before you go for the exits, <laughs> if I saw your list, you wouldn't have to worry about listening to me because I wouldn't even talk to you anymore. <laughs> Let me ask you something. Do you really think it would be possible for us to love one another if all of our thoughts about different people in different situations, if everything was exposed? I don't think that we could love one another anymore. I really don't think so. I was thinking about this, and it increased in my mind the incredible love of God. Because the Bible says, as a man thinks in his heart, so he is. God doesn't even take note of your actions. They are secondary. Because man looks on the outward appearance. God sees the heart and he sees all of the corruption and all of the jealousies and the hatred and the envy and the lust. And he goes on loving us anyway. It says in Psalm 90 verse 8, an amazing statement that our sins are in thy presence, it says and have been exposed, our secret sins, in the light of thy countenance. And God knows the whole thing and goes on loving us. Now, if that isn't love, what is? And my friend, this is Pastor Lutzer. I want to ask you a question. What have you been thinking about today? You say, well, I've been thinking about all the ordinary things, all of the tasks I have to do. I'm also bogged down because of things that have happened in the past or perhaps those who have done me wrong. I understand all that. But God is available to renew our minds. Let me ask you another question. Are you living with a tattoo? I'm speaking spiritually. I remember meeting a woman who had a tattoo on her arm. I asked her about it. She said, that was from my previous boyfriend who was untrue to me. She said, I can't get rid of it. Every time I see it, my past comes back. And I thought to myself, there are plenty of people out there with a tattoo that has been tattooed onto their souls. That actually is the topic of the first chapter of my book entitled, Putting Your Past Behind You. Are you living with a tattoo? Is there something that constantly reminds you of the past? Well, of course, the answer is God's forgiveness. The answer is the renewing of the mind. I wrote this book to help people who are in the depths of despair, oftentimes feeling very lonely, very hopeless. For a gift of any amount, this book can be yours. And I need to emphasize that if you think that this book isn't for you, I'm sure you know someone who would be helped by it. Here's what you do. Go to rtwoffer.com. That's rtwoffer.com. Or you could pick up the phone right now and call us at 1-888-218-9337. Now, in case you didn't have a pencil handy, I'm going to be giving you that contact info again. But thanks so much for helping us as the ministry of Running to Win continues around the world. Go to rtwoffer.com. Of course, rtwoffer is all one word. rtwoffer.com or call us at 1-888-218-9337. 
Time now for another chance for you to ask Pastor Lutzer a question about the Bible or the Christian life. When beliefs differ within a family, struggles soon follow. Eileen is in Zion, Illinois, and listens to WMBI. This is her story. My question concerns spiritual warfare. My mother and some of her friends heavily believe in battling demons with prayer, praying that the iniquities of your forefathers will be lifted off of you, and praying that demons would leave people. I've also read that if you're struggling with immorality, you can pray that the spirit of holiness will come upon you. I accepted Jesus as Savior when I was 17, and I believe that God is all I need and all I will ever need. I believe He'll protect me against demons and help me live as blameless a life as I can until I'm made perfect in heaven. I believe there are demons carefully watching, poised to strike, and I do believe they can inhabit people. But if God is for me, who can be against me? Why should I pray for some specific spirit when I have the Holy Spirit? This debate is putting a strain on our relationship, and I don't know what to do. Thank you so much for writing. I really read your question, and uh, I appreciated it because what it did is it helped me understand the struggle that this particular issue has brought about in your home. This is what I'd like to suggest. I think that your mother and her friends are extreme in finding a demon everywhere. I don't find within the scripture that um, what you need to do is to fight a demon, and this is the way in which we fight various sins and struggles. Though demons may be involved, scripturally what we do is we stand upon the rock of Jesus and his triumph. So I think that your mother and her friends are really extremists when it comes to finding demons everywhere. But on the other hand, I think that you have taken the opposite approach. You know, you say, I believe that there are demons carefully watching posed to strike, and I do believe they can inhabit people, but if God is for me, who can be against me? Why should I pray for some specific spirit when I have the Holy Spirit? Well, you are right. But it almost seems to me that as I read your particular response, you are taking once again an opposite extreme almost implying that we never have to have conflict with the devil. So here's what I propose. Why don't you and your family agree on some middle ground? The fact that there is such a thing as spiritual warfare, it is a reality. The fact that victory comes through the triumph of Jesus and believing in the triumph of Jesus. Sometimes we don't know if we're up against the flesh or demonic spirits. We can't distinguish But the answer always is the same, submission to God, believing in the triumph of Jesus, and standing our ground in the midst of temptation. So you as a family should be able to get along on this issue if each of you met in the middle. That's my suggestion. Keep reading the word, keep talking, keep uh, discussing, but don't break fellowship over this issue. Some wise counsel for Eileen from Dr. Lutzer. Thank you, Pastor Lutzer. If you'd like to hear your question answered, go to our website at rtwoffer.com and click on Ask Pastor Lutzer. Or call us at 1-888-218-9337. That's 1-888-218-9337. You can write to us at Running to Win, 1635 North LaSalle Boulevard, Chicago, Illinois, 60614. Running to Win is all about helping you find God's roadmap for your race of life. Subdue, control, and destroy. That's the language of war, Satan's strategy in the battle for your mind. Here on Running to Win, Pastor Erwin Lutzer continues a life-changing series on putting your past behind you. Next time, more about the ways your mind is being targeted to prevent you from fulfilling the will of God. Thanks for listening. For Pastor Erwin Lutzer, this is Dave McAllister. 
Running to Win is sponsored by the Moody Church.